Hey, hey. How's hey. everyone doing? Hello. All right. Thanks. We got some people in. Excited. All right. Uh, let's give it a minute so that more people can join. And then I'll, I'll, I'll let Ben uh, kick this off. All right, I think we're good to go. Uh, we have 15 people in here and I'll just quickly introduce the, the purpose of this meeting is to, to give more information about Indra and kind of understand how we can more efficiently collaborate. And we've, we've had Ben and John in our community since like April, I believe. And there are just a lot of amazing things that they're working on and we would like to, to expand the, um, these amazing things to, to the community overall. And I'll let you, Ben, kick it off. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Arthur, for setting this up, uh, especially on such short notice. And thanks to everybody who joined. Um, so I'm Ben Dury. I work at Harvard Medical School. And um, I'm leading a, a team within a larger lab called the Laboratory of Systems Pharmacology, which uh, uh, studies uh, the mechanisms of drug action on human cells and tries to sort of reinvent the science of drug discovery. Um, and our team that, that, that uh, John and I are uh, leading uh, is uh, uh, working on a variety of computational methods to um, uh, accelerate scientific discovery in various ways. And Indra is really the key underlying system in that effort. Uh, and so what I will do now is uh, I'll uh, show a few slides about Indra and the concept behind it. And then I will just switch over to my browser and, uh, and give a more practical introduction to where you can find everything, uh, what some of the downstream applications are from Indra, our COVID-19 model and so on and so forth. Um, and we can make, especially that part, we can make it a back and forth discussion and I'm happy to answer questions uh, along the way. Uh, all right, so I'll start with uh, slides. So um, conceptually, one of the key challenges in modern biology and systems biology especially is to gain actionable insight from large scale data. Where actionable insight can mean something like the ability to design your next experiment, but it could also mean something like uh, given a large data set, can you come up with a hypothesis for a potential drug that could um, be effective for a given disease, right? Um, and and uh, computational modeling of biochemical pathways has been one of the ways in which scientists have tried to uh, 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 make progress um, uh, in this area. And uh, what we call the first wave of such models um, are ones where expert, an expert would sit down, read the le relevant literature, uh, sort of uh, interpret that together with their own uh, general molecular biology knowledge, and then encode the set of interactions and mechanisms um, in a, in a model form as a set of equations or uh, uh, some other appropriate form. And uh, these models tend to be often quite precise. And uh, as you see from this figure here, they can often predict the dynamical behavior of a biochemical pathway. 
but they are fundamentally limited by um, uh, the scope that they can cover uh, to a large extent because of the huge manual effort that needs to go into uh, building such a model. On the, on the other end, you have uh, a, a huge amount of work in systems biology in which um, people take a large data set, such as the one you see in, in this figure, and try to derive um, connections, networks, uh, mechanisms from that data. Uh, you could call this data-driven inference um, of models and, and, and gain insights uh, that way. And so conceptually, our goal with Indra is uh, to some extent to bring these two together and create a third wave approach where we can automatically assemble detailed models like the ones on the left hand side, but at such a large scale that you can actually start using them on genome scale data. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just having trouble because the zoom window makes it difficult to switch slides. Okay, so. Um, uh, Conceptually, the system we have developed um, um, looks like this. On the left-hand side, you have various sources of knowledge, including pathway databases that are human curated, uh, the scientific literature, and also expert input. That is uh, somebody either um, summarizing their own knowledge or uh, coming up with hypotheses that are uh, you know, made up hypothetical um, uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, all of these pieces of information can go into a knowledge representation layer uh, where, where their representation is standardized. And then these round cyclic arrows are various kinds of operations on this knowledge uh, that we call a process of assembly. So this consists of various forms of error correction. Uh, there are many types of systematic errors uh, that creep in from various sources, especially text mining. Redundancy resolution, which is very important, both, both at the level of entities, that is the various ways in which certain things are referred to uh, in, in different sources, but also at the level of mechanisms. Um, relevance assessment for a particular use case or data set. Uh, uh, you can apply filters to, to try to find a subset of the knowledge that is applicable and relevant. The assessment of believability, that is how likely it is that a given piece of information is overall not incorrect. Um, um, and again, referencing text mining as a mode of input here, that is particularly important. Uh, and inferring missing information when you, when you take um, millions of fragments of individual mechanisms, you can actually often infer pieces of information that weren't explicitly there from by, by putting together these fragments. Um, and once this internal uh, assembly process is done, um, uh, you can then turn this knowledge into various executable and uh, uh, executable forms and forms that lend themselves to analysis, including mechanistic networks, for instance, that can then ultimately lead to uh, constructing explanations and predictions. And data comes into the picture in at least uh, two ways. One is it can, it can be used to uh, um, change how assembly works. That is the left pointing arrow from contextual data. Uh, and it can also be used to contextualize models. That is, um, for instance, parameterize executable models or uh, determine the structure of a causal network that is then used for analysis. And we have effectively implemented this concept as a, as a software architecture in Indra, um, uh, where on the left-hand side, you have modules that we call input APIs and processors that connect to knowledge sources and ingest information from those sources um, in a standardized form. In the center, you have Indra statements, which is the central knowledge representation within Indra that connects to a number of these red uh, nodes that are these internal assembly steps that operate over in the statements. And then on the right hand side, you have the different kinds of model assemblers, including assemblers that um, produce executable models that you can simulate, ones that we have several network assemblers that produce different flavors of networks, including um, for uh, causal pathfinding, but also for visualization, um, and we even have an English assembler, which you can 
which, which allows you to take a set of Indra statements and assemble them back into English language to create um, little reports, for instance, or human readable snippets. Um, now, there are many input sources to Indra, but really one of the unique features of Indra is that it connects to a very large number of natural language processing systems um, uh, that have very different characteristics. Um, here's a, this is not even a full list of all the NLP systems that Indra is integrated with. Um, you can see from these brief descriptions that each of these systems has very different characteristics. So for instance, the TRIPS system, which is, was developed by our collaborators at the IHMC, is a general purpose English language understanding system that you just adapt a little bit to recognize biological entities. And it's quite slow and um, doesn't really scale to literature scale, but it's very precise and gives you very deep semantic insights. In contrast, the REACH system, for instance, uh, gives you much less semantic detail, but it's very fast and you can run it on a, on a large body of text. And it's, uh, it's actually based on human engineered rules over a dependency parse of, um, uh, of text um, and so on and so forth. Um, we also have a number of general purpose causal relation reading systems that aren't that don't have anything to do with biology. They are they are developed to extract causal relations from any text. But you can actually, as I will show later, you can actually apply this to biology as well. Um, and then you run these systems and you get these fragments of mechanisms from them. Uh, like the boxes on top here, MAC phosphorylates ERK, uh, MAC1 phosphorylates ERK2 at T185, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are these individual fragments that could come from different sentences, different papers, different systems. Um, and uh, there are various issues with them. First of all, there's a large amount of redundancy. So you see MAC phosphorylates ERK appearing three times. There are uh, all sorts of errors here, for instance, uh, MAC being recognized incorrectly as a chemical like methyl ethyl ketone instead of as a protein family. Uh, sometimes reading errors result in things like the subject and the object of a relationship being, um, being flipped like ERK phosphorylates MAC. Uh, some of these statements have more details than others um, uh, and so on so on. And, and, and then the goal is to, at the end of, end of the assembly process, end up with a single non-redundant, correct, and detailed version of, of all of these fragments of knowledge. Uh, so this on the bottom here, this box would actually be the ideal assembled statement from all of these fragments. And there's a strong analogy here to genome assembly, which is what these colorful uh, little boxes are supposed to represent, where uh, when, when people sequence genomes, they end up with these short overlapping error prone reads that need to be assembled into a coherent sequence um, that, is, that, that then represents the genome. Um, and so we actually, so, so Indra, Indra, Indra can be used um, from scratch. You import Indra, you can reach out to sources, you can process some text, you can query pathway databases and, 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 and do your own assembly on whatever corpus you want. But we internally also developed the whole infrastructure around actually running Indra on every available input. Um, and the two kinds of input, one is biomedical literature uh, and the other is expert curated databases. And so to give you a sense of the scale of this, uh, we process the 25 million abstracts and uh, probably more at this point, more than 3 million full text uh, papers with multiple machine reading systems. Um, uh, every day there, there are about 4,000 new papers that appear uh, on PubMed, some, some just as abstract, some uh, have uh, full text available. Um, and uh, putting, put, putting this together with, with, the, with the various pathway databases, we end up with uh, 12 million unique biological mechanisms um, uh, that have overall 30, 38 million pieces of evidence from the literature, because typically one statement can have multiple pieces of evidence um, supporting it. Uh, and this is running constantly in the cloud on Amazon. Uh, so it's a form of continuous learning or continuous knowledge assembly. 
Um, and at the end of the day, what you can do with it is uh, query it in various ways. So you can, uh, here I'm showing natural language query examples, but you can do this programmatically as well. So you can ask things like, what does CDK12 phosphorylate? What activates SHIP2? How does JAK1 affect STAT3? And so on, and so on, right? So, so um, uh, there's, a, there's an API for this intro database that allows um, uh, querying it. Um, and then overall, this system has led to many interesting applications. So we've used it to um, um, the top, top left corner. We used uh, uh, Indra to build kind of expert models that are described in natural language. So, so somebody would sit down and write a paragraph in simple English language that describes a molecular mechanism. And then this mechanism is turned automatically into an executable simulation model that you can then inspect. And you can change the text, the original text, to change your assumptions, rebuild the model, look at the simulations again, and iteratively develop a hypothesis that makes sense um, uh, in terms of expectations or observations. And, um, um, Another possible, another application of the system that we've worked on is the systematic automated explanation of drug effects. That is the top right hand side here, where you have a large uh, data set of perturbations and readouts. You can imagine like each of the rules here being a one or uh, one drug or a combination of drugs. Each of the columns is a readout, like the state of a given protein. And uh, you know, the red boxes are going up, the blue boxes are going down or the opposite. And, um, and then you can point to each of these little um, entries here and say, how did that happen? Why did this drug increase uh, AKT phosphorylation, let's say. Uh, and you can then systematically apply an Indra model to explain these entries and construct mechanistic paths that explain how each of these entries happen. Yet another application that we've worked on is building dialogue systems where um, all of these capabilities are integrated into a back and forth human machine dialogue. Um, and I will show some examples of that. And finally, uh, what we call the RAS machine here, which has now been generalized into the EMMA framework is, is um, a, a website where you have um, models built around particular use cases that self update and self validate um, uh, continuously. So I'll stop with the slides there and then switch over to the browser. But uh, uh, if there are any questions at this point, please uh, let me know. Uh, I have a question about language support. So for example, if we have uh, Dutch language models, can we easily integrate it inside of Indra? Indra? Well, the, the language, language integration would be mostly done at the level of the reading systems and um, at least two of the reading systems that Indra is integrated with, namely Reach and IDOS, mm -hmm. uh, have been adapted to other languages because some of these um, dependency parsers um, that, that the reading systems are built on top of um, uh, can easily be switched from one language to another. And so, for instance, IDOS has been applied to Portuguese for a particular use case. Um, so that happens at the level of the reading systems. And what we see is the machine representation of the output um, uh, that uh, is supposed to be, uh, for the most part, language independent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so after you will get like two languages integrated, uh, how actually it works? So you need knowledge graph uh, to link all these entities in different languages. Well, if we were to, yeah, if you, I mean, I, I would say that um, if you assume that uh, you recognize entities and relationships between them from multiple languages in a way that those entities are grounded to an ontology, then mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what language they originally came from, right? Because, mm -hmm. because you will be putting them together uh, through their grounding to an ontology, not, uh, not based on the original text that they came from. And, um, you know, this is, this is more generally true in the, in, in the way we put together knowledge from different reading systems, pathway databases, and so on, because, um, um, 
it's effectively the same kind of uh, process. Mm -hmm. And do you have uh, like human in the, in the loop to verify all this link, link, linkage between entities? Yeah, yeah, in many different ways. And I, you will see once I start showing the websites, okay. the various ways in which the human takes part in this. But, but just to summarize, I, I guess there are particular use cases where there's a very strong human in the loop component, including the human machine dialogue, where it's really a back mm -hmm. and forth dialogue but also the natural language modeling use case that I talked about where somebody writes a paragraph describing the mechanism and then has the ability to iterate and change it. Uh, but also um, various forms of curation are things that, that, uh, that are human in the loop, even if the process is otherwise largely automated. And you will see that we have built out interfaces um, to support uh, curation. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, um, so I'll switch to my browser now. Okay, so the number one most important landing page for Indra is at indra.bio. Um, um, this actually is just a formatted version of the readme that is on the GitHub repo for Indra. So if you scroll down here, you can see the same text here. So this is at github.com slash sorter lab slash Indra. Um, and uh, this is where we discuss various development issues um, and, and, and su submit pull requests with changes. Um, and you can actually uh, see a more comprehensive list of all the sources for Indra. So these are the four uh, general purpose causal relation reading systems. These are biology oriented reading systems and you have uh, links out to either the software or papers describing them. And this is a list of all the pathway databases that, um, that Indra is integrated with. Um, there's also a way to access the Indra database through Indra. <laughs> there's a client for the Indra database in Indra to obtain statements. Um, and it might be interesting because, some, because Slava and others have worked on this. Um, Indra also has a hypothesis integration, which allows you to select some text on the web, um, paraphrase it in simple English and, 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 and save it. And then Indra has a way of pulling these in, processing them into Indra statements and making them part of any kind of assembly. Uh, and then on the output side, this is the comprehensive list of all the various assembler modules that you can use to generate uh, you know, simulation models, uh, uh, causal network models, um, and uh, Cytoscape.js, which you can display in a browser, um, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, in terms of how the knowledge assembly works, um, uh, so once you collected a set of statements, you can put together a, what we call an assembly pipeline simply by calling a, a sequence of functions that each operate over a list of Indra statements. And you can effectively compose these assembly functions over a, an initial list of statements um, uh, to end up with a set of assembled statements. So the kinds of things that we typically do in an assembly pipeline are filter out hypothetical statements that can be things like we tested whether A activates B, um, mapping grounding, which what that does is it fixes very common named entity recognition and grounding issues from text mining, but also standardizes the grounding of entities, which is especially complicated when it comes to chemicals, for instance. Uh, so this process makes sure that, that the various chemical namespaces are mapped to each other in a way that you can correctly find overlaps between things. It also standardizes the names of things. So when they come out, uh, when, when each of the entities come out of this process, they typically have standardized uh, names assigned to them. Um, you can filter out any ungrounded entities. You can filter out non-human genes if you're not interested in non-human genes. Um, this I won't get into. Uh, and then the very important uh, uh, function call here is run pre-assembly. What that does is it takes these individual statements from different sources that could effectively be equivalent as a, as a mechanism and finds the exact duplicates between them. So things that represent the exact same mechanism, but also partial overlaps between them. So for instance, 
a statement that is a more general form of another statement or a more specific form of another statement. It reconstructs a graph of statements this way. And through this assembly graph, it is able to calculate a belief score for each of the statements, which is based on a probability model that, that aggregates the individual error rates of each of the sources um, uh, and calculates the overall probability that a given statement is uh, not produced by a reading error, for instance. So the simple way to think about it is if you have an indra statement that has support from, uh, let's say, five pieces of evidence from one reading system, three pieces of evidence from another reading system, and two pieces of evidence from a pathway database, then the joint probability of this statement overall being incorrect is actually quite low because there's a lot of independent support for it from sources that have, uh, uh, you know, uh, some error rate. Um, yeah. And, and, and you can actually sometimes we filter statements for belief scores. So for instance, after this filter, you would end up with statements that uh, only, only the ones that are above 0 0.8 uh, belief, which roughly corresponds to 80% correctness. Um, and there are various flavors of how you can do assembly and you can, there's a large number of these assembly functions that you can compose in the way that you, that you like and that's appropriate for your application. Um, so I, I didn't explicitly point this out, but as you see, Indra is a Python package, so you can import modules of it in Python. But Indra is also available as a web service um, at api.indra.bio, um, and uh, that's in this tab. Uh, this is uh, pretty well documented for the most part. Uh, you can uh, invoke various sources. Um, you, can, you can run different pre-assembly functions. Uh, you can run uh, any of the model assemblers uh, that you want um, and uh, just communicate with this through the web. I will say though that that uh, since this web API, the public API is working with limited resources, it's appropriate for prototyping or relatively smaller uh, workflows, but not for large scale uh, reading and assembly. Um, still, for, for integrating with web services, this is, this is pretty convenient. Uh, Indra also has a very detailed documentation at indra.readthedocs.io. Uh, I would especially highlight the Indra modules reference, which uh, is really quite comprehensive in, 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 in the, in a, as a technical documentation of all the modules of Indra. And you can click on any of these and, 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 and take a look what's there. So, you know, the random module I clicked on, you see the documentation of all of the functions. Um, and, uh, and this is all generated automatically. So it's sort of more or less guaranteed to match what is actually implemented in the code. Um, so that's the documentation. Uh, if people are interested in, in, in um, we have a few publications about Indra and related topics, but really the most um, detailed and, and, and most uh, um, relevant publication for reading about Indra is this paper from 2017 called From Word Models to Executable Models of Signaling Networks Using Automated Assembly. And this paper doesn't yet discuss uh, literature scale assembly, uh, because at that point we were focusing more on small scale assembly of going from text to models. But still, this is a pretty good description uh, of, uh, of what Indra is and the concepts behind it. Um, okay, any questions about uh, Indra in general? I probably will ask <laughs> next question. Why do you think it's not possible to scale up um, Indra on Kubernetes, for example? Uh, I, it's, it's probably possible to scale it up. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we, I mean, right like we run, uh, we run the reading systems uh, using uh, Docker containers on AWS batch and mm -hmm. run assembly, uh, parallelized uh, in the cloud through Docker and so on. So it is possible uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. And for now, you're, you're only getting um, information from PubMed or? Um... Yeah. 
Right, that's a good question. Yeah, that's quite complicated actually how, how the literature content is obtained. So um, we, we get everything from PubMed. Uh, PubMed, only, PubMed itself uh, only contains uh, abstracts, right? But we get, we get all of those from PubMed and those are typically always you know, available. Uh, so that's what we fall back on as a default for any given paper. Uh, in addition, we take everything from PubMed Central, which has two components. It has a set of open access articles, and it has a set of so-called author manuscripts uh, that have different, different stories for why, how, how they come about. But to, together, they cover about um, 20 plus percent of published literature. Um, uh, so those are available as full text in a machine machine readable form in the sense that uh, uh, PubMed Central puts up these uh, so-called NXML files. They are a flavor of XML that can be easily processed into, you know, separating the metadata, like author names from different sections from the bibliography and so on. So that's very nice and, and, and good to work with. We also have institutional license uh, to Elsevier through Harvard, and Elsevier has a very good text mining API, and Elsevier is the biggest publisher out there, so, so that accounts for like 12% of published biomedical literature, and so we can get full text content from Elsevier through this license, uh, and whatever remains, which is about 68, 65, 68% is abstract. However, I, I forgot to mention this, but however, we, we also have a collaboration with another research team at the University of Wisconsin who um, also have a number of um, agreements with um, publishers to get licensed content from them and have uh, permission to do text mining on that content. And they also have a pretty good quality PDF to text pipeline. And so we, we sort of source out some of the literature reading to their servers and get back the results. And I can't, can't say exactly how, what percentage of literature that accounts for. But for instance, nowadays, when we process uh, preprints uh, or uh, other PDF-like content from publishers, it actually goes through that infrastructure and comes back to us as a set of interest statements. Mm -hmm. so, so basically just scientific papers, not uh, social media or just news? No, we that. haven't. Uh, no, we haven't done that. Uh, at, mm -hmm. at least not for biology. We have another project that is causal model assembly for general systems, and and there we 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 read various other content. But for 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 biology use cases, we have never really tried reading anything other than scientific publications. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Well, I mean, one could argue that reading Wikipedia um, or textbooks or whatever could be useful. Uh, no, I, I don't have any argument against that. It's just we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, cool. Okay, and then um, I now want to switch over to to the Emma website, uh, which is at Emma with two A's dot Indra dot Biome. Um, and actually, let me let me go. Uh, um, I just want to show one figure, one figure from the documentation here. Uh, this figure here. So Emma is is a is a, the ecosystem of machine maintained models with automated analysis. It's built on top of Indra, and um, uh, the idea is that you can define use case specific models uh, that uh, each have certain criteria for how they monitor the new literature as it appears. Um, that new literature is read every day by machine reading systems and any new extracted knowledge that is relevant for that given model is assembled incrementally into the model while assessing how the new knowledge relates to what we already knew, what is already in the model. And uh, through various kinds of uh, automated analysis, you can measure the effect of new knowledge uh, on, on the model's behavior uh, and notify users about any relevant new conclusions uh, based on the new knowledge that was assembled into the model on any given day. Um, uh, and uh, users can also query these models and um, 
and, and, and get notifications. Um, and so if you go to the Emma website, um, each of these cards is a different model and um, they have different stories. Like uh, you, you see, uh, I think six different cancer type specific models. Uh, like AML, breast cancer, lung cancer, um, melanoma, and uh, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer. The way these models are built is that we look at statistics of mutations in patient tumors uh, and try to reconstruct the relevant pathways around the typical mutations in these types of cancer, and then uh, uh, keep those updated as models. There are also models that are pathway specific. So for instance, the RAS machine is a model that is built specifically around the RAS signaling pathway, which is very important for cancer and other, other processes. Um, there are some models that are actually not built from the literature. They are, for instance, this RAS model and uh, the MARM model. They are actually built from natural language descriptions written by, by us, by, by, by human humans uh, uh, as specific hypothesis. So these are much smaller, uh, uh, carefully tailored models, but they are still automatically assembled. And finally, we have um, the COVID-19 model, which we set up in um, around March when COVID uh, hit the US, which is largely built around the CORD-19 document corpus, which is of course what the Kaggle challenge and, and general Corona Y also focuses on, but uh, Though initially it was really exclusively just based on CORD-19, more recently we have actually started adding to this new literature that we know is relevant for COVID-19 but isn't necessarily part of CORD-19. And also we have extended this model with some targeted queries into pathway databases, including for instance drug target databases um, um, that add crucial pieces of uh, knowledge to this model. Okay, so you can click on any of these, uh, uh, any of these models and look at their details. Um, and there are two main tabs on each of these pages. Um, once it loads, I, I should probably click this and show you this too. Uh, you can actually link out to this website called Index where you can uh, look at a network view of these models. For some reason, the network styling isn't correctly set on this model. Maybe I should show, a, let me show a different example that looks nicer. Um, uh, for instance, uh, let's look at the RAS machine model and see if that looks better. Oh yeah, this one has the proper network style. Um, uh, so this is kind of an interactive browser. That is a, this is a third party website, but it's quite useful in that you can visually explore the different relationships. You can click on any of the edges, look at at least one evidence sentence, link out to the PubMed paper. Um, um, you can click on the nodes and, and, and link out to uh, databases that they appear in. Uh, so this is a kind of third party browser, but, but what I'm actually gonna focus on is uh, what you can do on the Emma website itself. And this was when I clicked on the COVID-19 model, this is the page I, I landed on. So you see two tabs here, model and test. On the model tab, you see basic metadata about, about what this model is. When it was last updated, it's, uh, it looks like it was updated today as expected. Um, you can look at the distribution of statement types. These are Indra statement types. You can see that a lot of the information in this model is of the form activation and inhibition. So for instance, think something like, uh, you know, uh, ACE2 activates IL-6 or something like that um, would be an example and relatively fewer detailed mechanistic statements here. Um, you can also see what the top 10 agents are, the top 10 sort of concepts that are represented in the model. And you see a mixture of uh, high level concepts like infections, disease, and, and the molecular entities like uh, interferon or TNF or IL-6. Um, in terms of knowledge sources, uh, the top sources of knowledge in this model are uh, uh, text mining systems, REACH, Sparser, and IDOS are, are all three of those are text mining systems that produce a lot of content for this model. And then you see a number of pathway databases here, including CTD, the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database, 
um, which seems to have contributed quite a lot to this model. Um, you can see a list of the statements that have the most support, like the most individual pieces of evidence, including uh, SARS-CoV-2 activating COVID-19, which is, which is perfectly appropriate. Um, um, you can monitor the number of statements over time. Um, the big jumps are typically due to kind of structural changes that we make to how the assembly process is performed or we add a new source or something like that. Uh, the incremental changes that you, you don't really see visually the diff here, but if you scroll over it, you can see that incrementally this model is actually growing each day. And then each day you can actually see the new edit statements for that given day. And this view is quite noisy actually, because if you just look at specific fragments that come in from the literature, you see uh, all sorts of things, not all of which is pretty. <laughs> Uh, there are some interesting things like face masks inhibit death, which is actually a correct statement. If you look at the evidence sentence, face mask, adoption of face mask by the general public significantly reduces transmission rate and death. So face masks inhibiting death is actually a perfectly correct statement, uh, though perhaps not so useful for molecular uh, exploration. Um, uh, and uh, um, um, the cool thing is that you can actually click on any of these statements, just like I did here, uh, and, and, and you can read the evidence sentence and you can curate it to see um, if it's correct or incorrect. And in this case, I would actually consider this to be correct. Um, um, you, you actually have to register as a user and, 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 and log in in this top right hand corner. And I'm, I believe I'm already logged in um, uh, and, and could, could submit a curation here. Um, very often, you know, we would typically uh, focus on curating incorrect things when doing curations. Uh, I will show that maybe on another example on another page. Um, uh, there's nothing else on the model page. Okay, and then really a crucial idea of this framework is also uh, the test page, where the idea is that you take an independent set of observations or expected behaviors and you run your model to see if it satisfies all of the expected conditions um, uh, that, you, that you pointed it to. Um, and you can think of it either as testing, as, as making sure that the model works as expected, but you can also think of it not so much as testing, but rather systematic explanation. And I would, I would actually say that the two test corpora that we have for the COVID-19 model are not really tests, they are more like um, systematic explanation uh, uh, substrates because, because these two test sets are uh, based on published effects of drugs on viruses. So um, the COVID-19 curated test is a set that I actually manually curated by going to preprints and, 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 and papers and using hypothesis, hypothesis.is, uh, uh, selecting sentences and saying like, okay, this preprint shows that, you know, this drug inhibits MERS. And then I would add it to this set. Uh, and I can then use the EMMA model of COVID-19 to try to explain why any given observation uh, happened, right? So, what is the mechanism behind chloroquine phosphate inhibiting SARS virus? Or what is the mechanism behind, uh, you know, uh, imatinib inhibiting SARS or MERS? What you see here with these check marks is that different versions of the INDRA model that have slightly different causal, um, causal uh, assumptions uh, produced explanations for these test conditions. Um, and some of those explanations will be correct and some of them will be incorrect. And, you know, we can click on any of them and see, see what it looks like. Um, this is a, maybe not such a, such a nice explanation because what this says is that the way the satinib inhibits the SARS virus is by inhibiting apoptosis and apoptosis is activating SARS and therefore that's an overall inhibition. I would consider this to be overall probably incorrect because apoptosis shouldn't really be an internal node. Actually, the next round of development that we are going to do is apply a set of semantic constraints where 
when we look at these molecular level relationships, we will constrain these paths to not contain high level diseases or biological processes that um, shouldn't really be intermediate nodes. Um, uh, but in any case, you can browse the results of these tests and actually you can, uh, which I, I failed to show you, uh, you can actually go to any of these uh, statements, like any of these links in the explanations and link out to the actual underlying evidence for them, right? So for instance, MERS-CoV infection is mediated by the binding of viral S glycoprotein from which we got glycoprotein activates MERS. Uh, this is so-so, it would be nice to have a more specific uh, resolution for, for glycoprotein, but uh, this is effectively, effectively correct. Um, um, but you can curate these and, and mark different kinds of uh, correctness or incorrectness of these statements. If you mark a statement as incorrect, then the next time this test is run, it will find a different path because the incorrect statement will have been eliminated. And you can actually walk back in time and look at how uh, the explanation for this specific test changed over time. And sometimes you see interesting things changing either based on new knowledge or based on curations and eliminated edges. Uh, in terms of integration, uh, I want to point out that um, uh, that there's a way to look at all the statements in the model and, and download all the statements. And you can do this either by actually going through the website and clicking on this button, or uh, this button actually has a stable link that you see here that always points to the latest state of this COVID-19 model and is typically updated daily. And, and by the way, this JSON is a JSON serialization of Indra statements that are documented at, on some of the pages that I showed um, before. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, by the way, you can also curate on this page. So, for, so this is a ranked list of statements in the model. And uh, yeah, let's see, let's try to find one that is incorrect. Um, let's see, what is this? Yeah, this is, this is not totally incorrect. Um, yeah, this is a grounding error probably. So I can curate it as such, uh, right? And then, and then if I reload the page, you will actually see that these curations are marked. Uh, like this green, green pencil would be a correct curation. The red pencil uh, represents incorrect curation. Um, did that work? The one that I curated. I can't find it anymore. But yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to actually show you whether something is correct or incorrect. And the ones that are incorrect are over time eliminated uh, uh, from the model. Uh, so yeah, I think one primary point of integration for these statements is, 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 is really this uh, JSON dump of the daily build um, of the model. Uh, uh, one thing that Slava asked for, I believe is, um, is how to link to any one specific statement. So for instance, if you build some downstream application and want to link back to one specific statement, how do you do that? And the way to do that is if I click on this JSON button, you will see what, I, what, what happens here. Uh, the way to do that is, is to construct a URL that has the specific statement hash in it. So each statement has a, a few different identifiers, one of which is this hash. And, and, and there, are, there are ways to construct a URL that is specific to a statement hash. And, and you can see this one statement here with all of its evidences. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a way to do that too. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show about Emma. And since we're 50 minutes in, uh, we can either just do Q and A from here on out, or I can show the dialogue system briefly uh, if people are interested. Yeah, let's give it a moment for a Q&A um, and see if people have any questions. I have a question about your, uh, your, your, your chart, your graph. Rendell, uh, your volume is very quiet. The, maybe adjust the microphone to be louder. No, still very quiet. 
I can I can kind of make out what you're saying. Uh, uh, so let we can try. But yeah, it's still quite. I was just quiet. trying to understand the the red chart that starts out at 100 percent and then goes down. Ah. Yeah. What does that represent? Ah, good question. I should have I should have pointed that out. Um, so that was on the test page, I believe. Uh, how do we get back there? Let's just go through here again. Um, so the idea is that you can monitor how many test conditions are applied um, uh, on a given model as the model is updated and, and, and as it grows. And you can monitor the test passage rate. And um, you, you kind of have to, you, you have to look at these two charts simultaneously because the top chart alone is, can be misleading. So the, the bottom chart, it tells you the absolute number of tests that are applied to the model. And as you see back here in March, we had a single test, right? That was just like an initial entry there. And then we incrementally added more and more test conditions where each test condition is like drug inhibits virus. Um, and uh, currently, at least in, 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 in this, this set, we have 134 applied tests. And then you can see how many of those what percentage of those tests actually pass? What percentage of those tests we actually have explanations for? Sorry about the bad scrolling here. Uh, th th this, this chart doesn't start at zero. It starts at like 88. So what you see here in the end is actually a 91% passage rate. That is out of these 134 applied tests, 91% uh, uh, had some explanation in the model. And then the various weird jumps here are typically because of either temporary technical issues with the model or some change that we make to the overall process. Um, and the smaller, the smaller incremental changes are the ones that are kind of naturally occurring. Um, uh, but, but another way of thinking about this test is assume that, for instance, you, you add some knowledge to the model that disrupts its behavior, um, you might be able to detect it here as a drop in either the number of applied tests or past tests. So for instance, at this point, you see this big dip here. Um, that was actually due to a bug in the way we did a planned model extension. We wanted to add a certain new source to the model, but made a mistake. And you can actually see that it disrupted the function of the model. So we were like, hey, what, what caused this big uh, you know, test application decrease and found that accidentally we were filtering out certain things that we shouldn't have uh, and then fixed the issue and, 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 and things jumped back to normal. So, so it's, a, it's also a kind of debugging tool in addition to an explanation tool. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, you mentioned that language models would go to ontologies. Does yeah. that mean that all the entities have to be in the ontology or can, couldn't Indra discover new entities? And in which case, how do you handle multilingualism? Well, um, uh, we, so, so ideally things are grounded to some ontology because, uh, because when they are grounded to an ontology, you can in a principled way connect it to data, connect it to other knowledge and so on, right? So that's, you know, having things grounded to an ontology is a very important thing. However, if something isn't grounded to an ontology, it isn't a huge disruptive problem because you can still propagate it as a, as a piece of text. Uh, and in fact, it's quite useful to pick up things that aren't grounded because you can, by looking at statistics, you can, you can see what are some concepts in the absolutely brand new COVID-19 literature that we don't yet recognize, right? And so if you, if you look at, so I don't know if, you can find, if I can find a really nice example here, but um, um, let's see, let's go back to view all statements and, and see if we can find some examples of ungrounded things uh, here. NGO tends in two here. Um, for whatever reason, wasn't recognized from text. That's why there's no link out to identifiers.org, right? Because it's ungrounded. So it still shows up in the model and you can still have paths through it. Uh, but uh, for whatever reason, it wasn't correctly recognized by this reading system and therefore it's ungrounded. 
uh, and, and you see more uh, examples of this. Um, in, in many applications, especially applications where we do data analysis, we filter these out because, I mean, you, you analyze, uh, let's say, mass spec data where each of your readouts has a, you know, protein uh, ID. There's not much you can do with uh, things that aren't in an ontology. So we, we, in many cases, we throw them away, but precisely because we want to be able to discover new things, we let, let these things um, appear in this model. Um, so. Thank you very much. Can I ask that, another question? Oh, go ahead, Randall. Is there a way that, uh, that we can access this page that you have and, uh, and review this? Uh, yeah, so if you, uh, if you, again, if you start from the dashboard website, which is at emma.indra.bio, you, you, you find the COVID-19 card here and click on details. And then, um, and then, ah, now it's like reloading the whole thing. Um, then uh, 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 the specific page with all the statements, you can access that here, view all statements. Um, and that's how you land on this uh, page that actually lists everything that is in the model sorted by evidence. You can actually, and, and uh, now that we're looking at this page again, you can actually sort by paths, which means that you actually look at how many, how many explanatory paths of these drug effects does this given statement appear in and load statements ranked according to that. And then that's actually quite good for curation because this model has like hundreds of thousands of statements, many of which are irrelevant in various ways. Uh, uh, but but the, when, you, when you rank by how, how important a given statement is functionally to the behavior of the model on a particular problem, that's how you can uh, really effectively curate these things because, um, because otherwise you're just, you might just be curating irre irrelevant things. Whereas curating, let's say this one statement that seven paths depend on uh, is quite productive. Um, um, what does that mean when you say seven paths depend on? Yeah, so it, it, that, that goes back to this test tab, right? The test tab where we had these, uh, I'm terrible at navigating these pages, but <laughs> the test tab where you have these drug effect tests for which we construct explanations, right? It's the number of these explanations in which this given statement plays a role, right? Um, um, this is interesting because I think I just found a relevant incorrect statement. What you see here is that you have a sentence saying apoptosis is induced by SARS-CoV, whereas what we get here is apoptosis causing SARS. So this is actually incorrect. I would tag this as a wrong relation here. And with this one curation, I will you know, eliminate these seven errors from, from these paths and they will then be replaced by some other link the next time the paths are calculated. All right, so this is ranking by, by the number of paths is a more, more productive way of doing uh, curation. How many paths in total are there? Well, uh, we, don't, um, we don't display all the paths. So what we do is, um, Oh, I'm, I'm again lost here. Uh, yes. So for each of these tests, presumably there, there's more than one explanatory path, but for scalability reasons and for ease of human interaction, we actually only surface one of them, the top path. Uh, and uh, so basically it's one per test. So in, in this corpus, we have 130 tests, but there's this other corpus actually, which is much larger that I haven't loaded yet that has um, upwards of 2000 uh, drug virus relationships. Um, and so that, that has a larger number of uh, such paths. This is actually one of so, them. So is a path, is a path just a way of, uh, of uh, expressing a relationship uh, with uh, a variety of nouns and verbs, uh, but they all, they all come down to a, sim a, uh, a single logic. And that's your summary statement is the single logic. Yeah, so this is a form of model, model 
driven explanation where you take a, a causal uh, network and 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 you the definition of an explanation is a path in that causal network uh, and this is certainly a simplified view of what a what a mechanism or an explanation is uh, but we find it quite useful in understanding how a given drug can result in a given readout and um, for smaller models that scale better we also have a dynamical uh, analysis modes where you actually simulate the model and uh, uh, either by plotting intermediate species or by analyzing the flow uh, of different, the flow over different reactions, you can gain, gain some insights about what mechanisms are in play for a given perturbation readout pair. But this model is so large that, that it, uh, we, we cannot really dynamically simulate it that's more applicable to smaller models. So, for, for, so here we resort to this kind of causal pathfinding. Um, you can see many more examples of this, like, uh, you, you know, Darunavir inhibits SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, and, 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 and many thousands of other examples here. Um, unfortunately, many of these explanations are, are not totally correct. And there are, um, you know, one way of, one way of dealing with that is doing more curation, but another way is thinking about systematic ways in which these explanations can be improved, like a various semantic constraints over the paths. And but when uh, when someone when someone does a uh, review and curates mm -hmm. uh, a number of paths, does that modify the model? Um, in the sense, yes, in the sense that that statement for the purposes of analysis will be eliminated. Uh, from the model, it, it won't it won't to, won't be totally erased in the sense that we still keep it as part of the initial uh, as part of the raw knowledge that that is kept. But in any of the analysis that is being done with the model, it won't be included. So, if a similar piece of um, information were entered into the data set um, after the curation, mm. then um, then yeah. either the correct relationship would be identified or, or no relationship would be identified. Is that correct? Yeah, it, yeah. So in principle, what could happen is you look at a statement, you look at the evidence sentence, and you find that this evidence sentence doesn't support the statement. You mark it as incorrect, and therefore the statement disappears. And then maybe a week later, somebody publishes a sentence that actually supports that relationship correctly. Unfortunately, in the current setup, you that would sort of be lost for practical purposes. Um, but I actually think that given that most of these errors are actually due to text mining issues, it's, it's not that common that you curate something as incorrect and then later some other statement, other sentence comes along that actually supports it because Typically, these are kind of nonsense mistakes that just they just don't they just don't make any sense. They aren't they aren't things that are you know deep scientific controversies that you know what I mean. So it's a lot of a lot of the times, but it could certainly happen, and we are a little bit worried about that. Do, do you identify controversies? Do you identify specifically when you have uh, yeah. this is a statement? Here's the evidence against that statement. Here's the basically the opposite statement or Yes, and that's a big topic. So <laughs> the, the short summary is that, yes, Indra has the ability to, to find contradictions. Uh, depending on the use case, we either ignore that there's a contradiction and just, just use both versions of the statement, like A activates B and A inhibits B. In some applications, we actually explicitly resolve that controversy. And there are different strategies for doing that. One strategy is compare the amount of evidence. Another strategy is to stratify the evidence by context. So you can look at um, vemurafenib affecting BRAF in melanoma versus vemurafenib affecting BRAF in uh, breast cancer. And what you find is that there's actually a, you know, you could call it statistically significant difference between the two groups. And in those cases, you can, um, you can apply context um, uh, to 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 choose between the two, and that's actually a, a, a one of our ongoing, one of our most uh, interesting ongoing lines of work is how to apply contextual annotations 
for papers to various forms of model-based reasoning. Extremely um, interesting, yes. I might might be able to show you a network that in Georgia, actually, actually, I have to show you like a dev website to, to really um, that, that I'm looking at my own. So this is not something that is supposed to be used yet, but I can show you um, this specific example, um, BREF, and um, this is a network search where you put in a source and a target, and there are all these complicated settings for how you want to find pets, and you can actually put in a set, one or more mesh IDs, which are can be diseases, can be um, it can be really anything that is in mesh. Uh, I have no idea which one of these is interesting, but one of these should be like breast cancer, <laughs> which is the example I just cited. And then, and then in principle, what would happen is that the paths would be filtered to statements that have evidences that are from papers that are about breast cancer, right? Um, and it actually often makes a big difference, especially in the path ranking, um, uh, what context you search in. Um, uh, so this is something we are trying to integrate in the various, uh, into the various applications that we develop uh, and are quite excited about it. Um, oh, there's a question on the chat. Um, I have to stop sharing to see it. <laughs> Uh, access for for uh, for uh, to access the website, it's all open and, and basically everything we do is open source and, and and on GitHub and the websites are openly accessible. Um, one thing to note though is that we don't think so much about it in the academic world, but the content of some of the, the content coming through some of the knowledge sources that Indra aggregates is actually light, uh, controlled by sometimes by non-commercial licenses. So for-profit companies actually have to look into the source of that knowledge and make sure that they are not violating the original usage rights for academic or non-profit research purposes. Basically all of this is, uh, all of this is, you know, good to go. Um, um, well, any, anybody can make a, make a change to Oh, curations? Uh, yeah, yeah. curations. So, yeah, yeah. So the way it works is you have to register, but once you are registered, your curations go into the same set of curations as ours. And uh, we haven't yet encountered any, any form of, uh, you know, abuse of, <laughs> of curations. So uh, the, the curations from outside groups that we have gotten so far are, are really great and valuable. So we haven't had any issues with it. Okay, thanks. So quick question, because uh, I was wondering, you were showcasing one of the statements and angiotensin 2 was not categorized. And uh, just because we had kind of like a successful effort of using UMLS and other dictionaries to recognize these entities, um, what, what is the reason like why this uh, specific instance is not categorized? Um, it, it, it can, I, I don't know specifically about that specific example, but a few ideas. One is that um, each of the reading systems works in a different way. They have different grounding resources, different dictionaries. And so some reading systems may not recognize angiotensin to, they, 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 they pick it out as a named entity, but they don't know how to connect it to a particular ontology entry. And one reason for that may be that angiotensin 2 is actually it's not a full protein, it's actually a cleaved protein product. And uh, cleaved protein products aren't primary uniprot entries that you have, to, you have to ground them to a more complicated set of IDs. And that, that might be a reason why angiotensin 2 was problematic in that particular example. But I, we, I, I'm pretty sure we have versions of angi angiotensin 2 that are actually correctly grounded. Um, because uh, that brings another question of mine. Is there, because you use kind of the ensemble of different reading systems, do you have any kind of like priorities or priorities that are domain specific? Uh, priorities uh, in terms of like one reading system over another or? Um... Yeah, like one system actually, you know, detects this as a chemical and the other one detects this as a hormone or like how do you deal yeah. with that? 
the way we deal with it is, is uh, during assembly, we have uh, several steps that try to improve the quality of grounding. One is the grounding method, which, uh, for which we over the years have manually curated thousands of entries that are systematically misgrounded. So there's some amount of manual curation of, of mapped groundings. We have, um, there's a paper about the two, we have these machine learned disambiguation models what they do is they look at acronyms that are used in different senses in different contexts, and they try to classify each instance of that acronym as it appears in text to a correct resolution. The reading systems don't do this at all. The reading systems are, you know, they are just, every reading system we have ever, ever used does pretty trivial dictionary lookups for grounding. But during assembly, we can actually bring in additional context, additional surrounding text to disambiguate certain forms. So that's another thing. We standardize IDs. So let's assume you have, uh, chemicals are, are pretty complicated in this sense. So a chemical example is, is good where you have one reading system that grounds to PubChem, another reading system that grounds to Kebi, CTD grounds chemicals to MASH and CAS, for instance. And then during assembly, we standardize these IDs using cross-references to figure out what two things are the same, right? It's very obvious, this is, this is really a ubiquitous problem. Uh, and, and, and that's another form of standardization. Makes sense, thank you. Uh, the, the other thing I want to say in terms of prioritization is that um, you certainly can put things together any way you want, right? Like Indra is not, you, you don't, Indra is not just these end results that you can download and dump off. It's, it's actually some, a system that you can run any way you want. And so if you want to take your favorite pathway database and take any part of it and use your favorite reading system and read one paper that you're interested in, you know, you can do that and put that together any way you want. So it's not, there are no constraints on how you put things together for a given use case. Great, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, there, there are a couple of questions on the chat that I could briefly address. Oh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Do you keep a provenance information of curators? Yes, we do. Um, uh, so when you create an account, you put in your name and email address and, and that's kept the email address of the curator, uh, date of curation, the other data about what the curation was, what statement it, it points to. So those are all kept, but they aren't surfaced publicly because they aren't really supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But no. uh, I think I think much more interesting to keep uh, also uh, like Orchid and uh, probably GitHub. Ah, and Orchid. Very good because, point. Yeah. Because if you are dealing with medical expert, yes, yes, actually, <laughs> it's very valuable uh, feedback. I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. I, I, I love, I love the idea of using Orchids. And at the time we implemented this, we just didn't have this in mind. But since then, in one of the projects I started, I started. Uh, keeping track of author provenance or contributor provenance using ORCIDs. And uh, I, I will absolutely go back to the team and we'll try to try to connect this to ORCID. I think that's okay. a great idea, yeah. Um, you mentioned licensing. Is the licensing status exposed in API? Well, yeah, that's tricky. I mean, there, yeah, I mean, basically, you would have to read up on the licenses of each of the sources and it's up to you how you how you deal with that information because we don't really have support on our end for filtering uh, but, by license. Um, okay, but, but the sources are in the API results so I could go to the source and get the license information through the yes. API? Yes, yes, yes. And that's in, that's in fact required by many sources like CTD, for instance, right? So if you expose CTD information on your own interface, you have to link back to CTD. And we, we always do that, right? We, we link back to the source, we link to the paper. If it's, um, if it's licensed content from Elsevier, let's say, we can only expose a certain amount of text as evidence and have to link back to the paper. And th these are all um, and only the abstract, if it's not a public paper, I was thinking of that. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, something I was thinking about is if you, if I were, I'm not, if I were a publisher and I wanted to run my own little Indra for my own private papers, could I, could we, could there be a system of federation of, sorry, that's my hat, federation, uh, so that we could access, like, connect that private Indra database with a public Indra database so some <laughs> things yes. could be done together, whereas you'd still have yes. access. Is yeah, that... absolutely. And we actually have an example of that in the system as in operation where we got it. So, so Elsevier actually has a text mining system called MedScan and you will almost not find anything about it out there. But at some point we had a collaboration with them and they gave us a bunch of, bunch of extractions, uh, like half a million papers maybe. It's actually a pretty good text mining system, not much better than the public ones, or not, not better than the public ones. It's about the same as those, but it's another source. And so it's good. And um, what we do is we have those internally, we count them as evidence, but we never expose the MET scan results. So you might see something like a badge that says 27 pieces of evidence, but when you click on it, you only see 15 because 12 came from this uh, classified source, right? So yeah, so you can, you can take that into account when you calculate uh, belief scores, but without actually exposing the specific piece of evidence. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just curious, can, can you get a knowledge graph for, from Elsevier? Because uh, they, they have their own knowledge graph, you know? That, yeah, that's what have. I meant. Can we, can we connect the knowledge graphs? If they have their Indra, you have your Indra, and can we connect with knowledge graphs? Well, I know I architect of so. this system because he used to work with me and uh, in, in one of the projects. So basically, also, we have some components in Corona Y <laughs> from developed by both guys. And mm -hmm. uh, so we are following the same principles and even sharing the same people uh, ideas. So yeah. at some point we can connect, I think, and uh, can, can get some, some new yeah. insights. Yeah, I mean, like there are, it's probably possible to integrate in several different ways. The, the one that we typically do is we would take, you know, somebody else's knowledge, process it into Indra statements, and then it just goes into the same process as everything else. Uh, but you can do it the other way around. You can take Indra statements and put it together with an existing knowledge graph in some other format. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's pretty flexible, I guess. Okay, I, I think good step. Uh, and uh, we discussed a little bit about this. So if you'll get uh, every statement as a kind of web resource, you can build a knowledge graph around it. And uh, there is potential to get all entities linked to this and uh, to get all relations. And after to link to other knowledge graphs like, like Elsevier has. So it can be interesting idea also. Yeah. Another, another way of thinking about integration is um, assume you have a model that has uh, some representation of entities and relationships between them. Um, you can use Indra simply to enrich that model with literature evidence. And we did this, for instance, with um, some of you might be aware of this COVID-19 disease maps community. Um, and uh, they built, uh, these are a group of expert modelers um, who, who built a very detailed model of, um, of COVID-19 uh, at the molecular level. And, um, but they built it in a way that, you know, one person would read a paper and then say, huh, okay, so this activates that, let's put that in the model, not necessarily annotating with the whole body of literature that actually supports that. So what you can do is you can take that, take that map and for each of the relationships, query Indra for supporting evidence, um, right? Um, and uh, that's another way of thinking about integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, lots of potential in here. Definitely something to, to think about, digest and come back with some proposal on ideas. I'm pretty sure Mark, Slava and uh, everyone and even medical professionals like Randall have some uh, things they, they would imagine um, to collaborate on. So thank you, Ben, uh, for giving us a presentation. I think that was an, an amazing overview and I definitely understand way more about the nuances and yeah. 
Look, looking forward for more. Cool. Yeah, we should talk about the dialogue systems next time. <laughs> yeah, maybe okay. that's the the next topic of the presentation. <laughs> Sounds good. So let's okay. let's Thanks a lot, on. everyone. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.